I am going to do a very old fashioned paper without PowerPoint, simply because um, I find the, the, the easier um, you make technology, the easier it is. So I'm just going to talk, the pure pleasure of you just listening to me rather than actually having um, slides to go with it. So I am going to talk now about French prisoner of war theatre in Spain and England during the Napoleonic era. I should say, first of all, that I owe a huge debt to Devon Cox, who was one of my PhD students here at Warwick, who wrote a thesis on stages of captivity, Napoleonic prisoners of war and their theatricals, 1808 to 1814, which he successfully completed in 2017. It was Devon's involvement with the historic theatres of Europe route that brought to my attention in the first place an amazing collection of archival material relating to the prisoner of war theatre at Portchester. So what I'm going to do today is give you an overview of prisoner of war theatre, primarily in a British context, but because we're looking at this from an Iberian perspective, uh, I am going to mention uh, Spain as well. There were tens of thousands of French prisoners of war in Britain during the Napoleonic period. Whether out on parole or held in prisons or on prison hulks, theatre was a common feature of their experiences. But until recently, it received little scholarly attention. As I've just explained, in 2017, Devon Cox completed a doctoral dissertation on Napoleonic prisoners of war and their theatricals, which focused on the theatre built by prisoners at Portchester Castle. The same year, a new permanent exhibition about the theatre opened at the castle, and its launch was marked by a performance funded by my Arts and Humanities Research Council project on staging Napoleonic theatre of Rosaliska, a melodrama written by two of the prisoners of war held there in 1810. Since then, Devon and I have co-written an article exploring the reliability of memoirs written by the prisoners of war held at Portchester and what we can learn of the structure of the theatre there from surviving archival material. This current presentation extends the field of study to the prison hulks out in Portsmouth Bay and compares and contrasts the onboard theatricals with those that took place on the purpose-built theatre at Portchester, as well as those put on by officers held on parole in towns across the country. In so doing, it explores the extent to which theatre was perceived by the prisoners as a particularly French response to difficult circumstances and as a conduit for reinforcing their national identity. These plays were performed in front of English guests, most notably the naval officers who gave the go-ahead for performances, but also civilians. In offering melodrama, vaudeville, opera comique, the prisoners were contributing to an important cultural exchange, giving the British a chance to see canonical plays as well as new releases straight from their premieres in Paris. The breadth of the repertoire allows us to rethink the relationship between prisoners and jailers, or should we say hosts, as there is no doubt that there was a significant element of cultural exchange taking place. For the length of a performance, at least, the fact that they were ostensibly enemies on opposite sides of the conflict was put to one side. One of those involved in theatre during his time in Britain, Joseph Quentin, explains in his memoirs that the taste for theatre was strong amongst the French, as in the most disagreeable circumstances they still looked to satisfy it. Although written to stress the superiority of a particularly French resilience to circumstance, and as my current PhD student, Abigail Coppins has said, um, to reinforce a sense of survivor guilt, these memoirs find echo in the archive. We know from first-hand accounts such as these, but also from a handful of surviving playbills that French theatre was performed the length and breadth of Britain and beyond, often for invited audiences who were sometimes given plot summaries in broken English to help them follow the action. The prisoners performed French classics such as Voltaire and Moliere, but also hits from the Paris stage, as well as plays they wrote themselves while in captivity. Theatre was both, therefore, a reinforcement of national identity and a space for cultural exchange. By the end of the Napoleonic Wars, about one third of prisoners of war were housed on the prison hulks. They were largely populated by men from the French Navy and run as any other British prison ship. Philippe Masson's monograph on the Hulk says that up to 1,200 prisoners could be held on each ship. French accounts of the Hulks, but also British historians since, have seen them as hells upon water. But on a number of ships, the prisoners put on theatricals and British guests, including civilians as well as officers, were invited to watch performances. So conditions on board were perhaps not quite as fetid as some accounts might suggest. 
Permission to perform may in part have been the result of the humanitarian patriotism that Renaud Morieux has identified as a British strategy to mobilize public opinion during the Napoleonic Wars. That said, the British Navy had a tradition of onboard theatricals as a means of occupying those at sea for extended periods of time since at least the mid 18th century. Most famously, Napoleon was treated to some British naval theatricals as he made his way from France to Plymouth before being sent on to Saint Helene. It seems that the lieutenants in charge of the vessels were happy to allow theatre to take place on board, primarily for its therapeutic benefits rather than propagandistic purposes. The fact that the transport board in charge of the prisoners of war was often unaware that theatre was being performed by prisoners and tried to put an end to it where and when it did find out, suggests that those in charge of the prisoners of war on the hulks were not necessarily seeking ideological advantage from per permitting performances. We have one precious playbill for a prison hulk performance. It's a double header at 3 p.m. on Friday the 10th of July 1807 on board the Crown. There is the premiere of a historical drama, The Revolutionary Philanthropist, or The Hecatomb of Haiti, a historical drama in four acts and prose written by one of the French prisoners of war on the ship. It's about the slave revolt in Haiti in 1793 and is followed by a, is it, to quote, a very gay and diverting comedy, that is Molière's Médecin Malgré Lui. Molière is perhaps an obvious choice for a group of prisoners wanting to craft a particular image of the French amusing themselves, even in the most difficult of circumstances. But an amateur historical drama about revolution and the efforts of those of African descent to overthrow their enslavement is perhaps a more surprising choice. Mary Isbell has done valuable work on the playbill as artifact. Let me just summarize here some of the key elements of this document. It's written in English, as seems to be the norm for prisoner of war playbills of the time, presumably for the benefit of British officers and or civilians invited to watch. It proudly proclaims a grand performance. The memoirs often talk about entrance fees and earnings. And although there's no ticket price indicated on the playbill, as French playbills of the time didn't normally include such information, the fact that the prisoners involved in the performance call themselves a dramatic society implies that profits would be shared. Furthermore, their organisation as sociétaire indicates that this was not a one-off event, but a regular activity, and one which those involved expected to provide income. The playbill boasts that the premiere of the revolutionary philanthropist on board the Hulk will be adorned by its whole show and spectacle, and fighting with swords and pistols. This does commemorate, co sorry, corroborate the memoirs which talk of Hulk plays containing costume, orchestra, backdrops, all of which would form part of an audience expectation of show and spectacle. Fight choreography was a standard part of early 19th century French popular theatre, and the manuscript of the play confirms that weaponry is a key element of the plot, including gunshot off stage. We know that Portchester Castle had a fencing school, and that therefore weapons were put in the hands of prisoners of war, so it is possible that the theatrical performances were also using authentic props rather than wooden replicas. Permission to use weapons would have had to have been granted by the officer in charge of the ship. And the support of the prison hulk's commander was an essential ingredient in the success of any theatrical venture, not just on the crown, but on other hulks. Prisoner of War Depot at Portchester and Dahl and other missions. Revolutionary philanthropy the commander concerning the property of the hour, it's clear that without permission from the officer, no public theatricals would have been possible. It's likely that the sailors held on the crown were part of Napoleon's ex expedition against Saint-Domingue when he attempted to regain control of the island in 1801, 1802, 1803. We know that leading figures from the consulate's attempts to restore French control of Haiti had been held on the prison hulks in Portsmouth Bay since their capture by the British in 1804 notably the Vicomte de Rochambeau and his forces. And this may have inspired the anonymous playwright to use the 1793 revolution as a means to explore the current lack of liberty. As such, it offers an intriguing example of how those involved in global military campaigns absorb and are influenced by their surroundings. But French prisoner of war theatre was not just to be found on the hulks. The memoir writer Joseph Quentin describes the theatre as a small wonder, saying that it had as good machines as those back in Paris, and archival evidence does seem to back that up. Devon Cox in his thesis has shown how French prisoners captured at Bailen 
performed puppet theatre in the prisoner hospital at Isla de Leon, the Hospital de la Segunda Aguada, apologies for my Spanish pronunciation, and then in a disused water cistern on Cabrera. Memoirs suggest that it was one of the French doctors in the prison hospital who encouraged the puppet theatre, a man called Auguste Tillay, who had published an account of the medicinal benefits of theatre at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, having survived both conditions of captivity in Cadiz and the Isla de Leon and the in inhospitable island of Cabrera. We have a detailed description of one of the puppet shows from one of the prisoners. We're told in Ducot's memoirs that the prisoners enjoyed Polichinelle before the Inquisition and the supposed maniac or the universal flood, which is labelled as a, and I can't translate it into English because it really doesn't work, hydraulico tragicomédie parade avec tableau. Historians have long on reliability of memoirs, and the presentation of what sounds an extremely ambitious performance might seem like the exaggeration of superiority in the face of Spanish jailers. But many of the prisoner of war memoirs have in other places matched archival evidence, and so I don't think we should reject this implausible staging out of hand. Jean-François Carré, whom I mentioned a moment ago as the architect and machinist of the fully working theatre in Portchester, was one of the most talented machinists of the age. He was in Cadiz, and it would be entirely within his capability to produce stage effects for a puppet show, including aquatics. If anyone listening has worked on the prisoner of war sites at Cadiz and the Isla de Leon and knows of any registers of captives, it would be great to be able to look at who was held where and when. Please let me know. And if there are any first-hand accounts by Spanish guards of theatrical activities, please, again, I'd like to hear of them. Though unlike the situation in Britain, it seems as though in Spain, performances were for the French alone. The puppet theatre serves to reinforce French identity in the face of defeat. In Polichinelle, in front of the Inquisition, Ducor tells us that Napoleon appears as a deus ex machina to enlighten the Spanish. We're given a description of Napoleon appearing in the, a halo of glory, seated in a chariot guided by the genius of civilization. So this, this puppet play, shadow play, ends with Napoleon bringing civilization to disorder and chaos, and even the Spanish rejoice at his arrival. The themes of freedom, imprisonment, resistance and loyalty suffuse this description of the puppet play. And they're also a hallmark of other prisoner of war theatre scripts, such as the revolutionary philanthropist and Rosaliska, the melodrama written and performed at Port Chester in 1810. French prisoner of war theatre not only serves to explore the hopes and fears of the prisoners, it also becomes a conduit for reinforcing their national identity. Plays are performed in French, which allows the actors to assert a linguistic ascendancy over the site of their incarceration and their audience, if there is one, as the audience can be moved to tears without understanding a word of the dialogue. The physical space also reinforces the notion that theatre is a French space. On the prison hulk, the Guildford, one of the memoirists, Lardier, describes the theatre being decorated in red, white and blue, the colours, the national colours, the colours of the revolution a deliberate act of asserting Frenchness in a British space. As Helen Gilbert has shown, theatre is a means by which communities register, reiterate and or contest modes and models of national belonging. The design of the space for the performances on the hulks is consciously looking to exploit the affective power of national affiliation and reinforce a sense of collective identity, if I can use some of the work of Nadine Holdsworth on um, naval theatre. It's less clear, however, what effect this would have had on British invitees in the audience. And again, we're, we're sourly lacking in evidence from those who've watched the theatricals. We've got a lot of evidence from the French themselves, very little from those who were watching. At Porchester Castle, the curtain was painted to resemble that of the Théâtre de la Cité in Paris, with a view of the Pont Neuf and key Parisian landmarks, including the Louvre and the Tuileries Palace. These examples of decor in the memoir suggest, at least for the length of the performance, the theatre space, whether temporary on the Hulk or in a permanent structure as at Portchester, become a miniature France, and in fact, even more specific, that a miniature Paris. The national colours, French music, lines spoken in French, visual reminders of back home, such as the scene on the curtain, all combine to create a space which allows the possibility of a return to France. The prisoners at Portchester, captured within weeks of being conscripted into Napoleon's army in 1807, 
are having been in Cadiz, having been sent to Cabrera, having then ended up in Port Chester, when they thought they were going home to France, have been prisoners of war for seven years at this point. So there's very much a, a, the, the, the theatre is serving as a, as a way of thinking through that possibility of a return home. In this way, theatre is not simply a diversion, a means to pass the time, but a way of reaffirming their Frenchness and of mitigating the trauma of imprisonment. The nostalgic recollections of home in the decor and on stage reinforce the emotional ties binding the prisoners of war together. There is a third space for performance I've not yet mentioned. In addition to the large numbers of prisoners of war on the hulks or in prisons, there were officers on parole, as, Ev as Everisto has told us, in dozens of towns across the country. The scope they had for interacting with a British civilian audience was obviously greater than for those in captivity. We only have a handful of playbills, occasional references in memoirs, and comments from the transport board from which to build a picture of these cultural encounters. Those on parole were of course officers, and this does have an effect on repertoire. The differences in repertoire suggest that different classes may have approached national identity in different ways. Whereas the Hulk prisoners were buying into a populist narrative of nationalist propaganda, the higher officer classes seem to perform more the identity of the cosmopolitan enlightened individual. The idea that Frenchness is equated to civility is much more um, prevalent in the parole towns. If melodrama was the genre of choice at Portchester Castle, it barely features in the parole towns. Devon Cox, in his thesis, uh, he has a chapter on parole town prisoner of war theatre. Uh, Devon has shown that the repertoire chosen reveals cooperative cultural dynamics because the officers seem to offer plays with particular resonance for their British audience, such as Voltaire's Death of Caesar with its nod to Shakespeare or the double Garrick uh, with its recognition of the British actor's undisputed place in theatre history. These two plays were formed by officers in Ashby de la Zouche and suggest that the theatre troupe were selecting plays that would appeal to or be relevant to the local audience and reflect their own tastes. One of the actors, Pierre-Marie-Joseph Bonnefou, who spent his time in Odium in Hampshire on parole, described his theatrical endeavours in his memoirs. He says, everything was our own work, costumes, mise-en-scène, music, couplets, orchestra, composition or arrangement of pieces. It was an inexhaustible source of occupation and we enjoyed ourselves immensely. The English couldn't get enough of our performances. They even came from London to see us act. And really, it was all in very good taste. It's a happy time when even the most bitter of sorrows flee at the sight of pleasure. Again, little evidence archivally to suggest that we can we know for certain that people were traveling from London to um, Odium to look at the, the theatricals. Anyone who's got any evidence to, to, to show that, I really would love to see it. The transport board responsible for the prisoners of war was less enamoured than the spectators. They were anxious about the nefarious influence of French theatre, and these concerns mirror those of the London press, worried that professional British theatre was being corrupted by French influence. In October 1811, the transport board circulated instructions to their agents in parole towns. Having understood that theatrical reputations have been exhibited by our French officers, many of the parole towns, it is our duty to inform you that we've never approved of or allowed theatrical representations at any of the depots under our charge, nor is it consonant with the laws of this realm that any foreigners should institute such unauthorised exhibitions whose tendency may be dangerous in political or licentious principle. Interestingly, we find that where there is evidence about theatric, prisoner of war theatricals, it is overwhelmingly the French who are putting on theatre. There's a small amount of evidence that the Danish were also putting on plays, We've yet to find any evidence that any of the Spanish prisoners that Evaristo has been talking about in Plymouth were performing theatre. Again, searching for the, for, the, for the indications that that might be the case. But it is overwhelmingly in the archival evidence and in the, the, the memoirs that it's, it's French prisoners of war who are doing the, the theatre. So just to conclude, the theatrical performances of French prisoners of war show that there was repeated and widespread cultural encounter between the French and the British during the Napoleonic Wars. Despite, despite the military conflict between Britain and Napoleon's empire, British audiences were able to enjoy performances of French plays both classics and the latest popular hits from the Parisian Boulevard theatres. Evidence for British responses to the plays they were watching remains elusive. 
though the fact that ephemeral documents such as playbills have survived suggests that the theatrical events were of sufficient significant significance to some individuals to retain them as mementos. And Charles William Patterson kept play scripts, letters, um, a, you know, a full set of paraphernalia around the theatre at Porchester. The performances on the Hulks and at Porchester Castle can only have reached a relatively limited audience, but news of the quality of the performances extended much more widely through press reports, most notably. Theatre was perceived by the prisoners as a particularly French response to difficult circumstances and as a conduit for reinforcing their national identity, but it relied on the approval and tacit support of those in charge of the prisoners. The tension between the authorities in London and the realities of prisoner of war life on the hulks in depots such as Porchester or in the parole towns were never really resolved. And as is often the case, attempts to prevent the French prisoners from putting on plays only redoubled their efforts to perform and reassert their identity. Whether they were conscripts or enlisted willingly, those prisoners of war give us a rare insight into their conception of nationality, their ideas of loyalty, their image of France in the theatre. Theatre is a collective enterprise, which makes it a different space from some of the individual memoirs that we have traditionally used as evidence for prisoner of war life in Britain. Theatre is a shared space. It unlocks, therefore, a prisoner of war experience that is surprising, but just as valid a set of evidence as any of the other sources we might use to understand the circumstances in which prisoners of war found themselves during the Napoleonic Wars. Thank you. <laughs>